tonight. This is the third lesson of Bible analysis, rightly dividing the word of truth tonight. And let's ask the Lord to bless our classes tonight. Our Father, I want to thank you for these students that have come out tonight to learn how to study the word of God. And I'm asking that you might one more time anoint me with thy Holy Spirit as I teach and anoint ears to hear. And for others that will be viewing this tape, I pray, Father, that this lesson tonight will be beneficial to them. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 This is the third lesson in our study of Bible analysis. The purpose for these lessons is to train the sincere student of the Word of God in a method of Bible study that will help him to understand the primary meaning of any passage of Scripture. Now, if you notice, look at that verse. It says, the sincere student. I believe that the reason that you're here is that you sincerely want to learn how to study the Word of God. And when I mention the primary meaning of any passage, that's the first meaning right here. There could be some secondary applications and personal applications that God will bring you from there, but we want you to be able to understand the primary meaning of the Scripture. That's what this course will do for you. The text, text verse for the student of the Word of God is 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Notice the last part of that verse, rightly dividing the word of truth, and that happens to be the name of our lesson tonight. The reason for highlighting and underlining the last part of that verse is because of the importance of rightly dividing the word of truth. Unless a Bible student learns how to rightly divide the scriptures, he or she will not be able to really understand the message of God as revealed in His Word. Another passage of Scripture Bible students should learn is 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. Knowing this, first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Private means independent interpretation. The prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved. Moved there means very gently along by the Holy Ghost. This verse simply teaches that one cannot determine a Bible doctrine by a single verse if that one verse is not in agreement with the rest of the Bible. Amen. There are no contradictions in the Bible when it is rightly divided. Remember that. There are no contradictions in the Bible when it is rightly divided. But if you do not rightly divide the word of truth, there's going to be all kinds of contradictions in the Bible. And that's why it's important to learn how to rightly divide the word of truth. Mm -hmm. Knowing how to rightly divide the scriptures will help one to better understand the meaning of a verse or passage of scripture that seems to contradict other truths in the Bible. The next verse teaches the doctrine of the inspiration of scripture how we receive the Word of God. God inspired men who spoke His Word and then either they or someone else wrote what God had through the Holy Spirit, moved or inspired them to speak. The Bible is the Word of God. If you're ever going to understand anything, you've got to believe that. The Bible is the Word of God. It is a single unit Consisting of 66 books. Now how many books are there in the Bible? 66. 66. God used 40 men to write the Bible. These men were from three different continents. The Bible was written over a period of 1,500 years in three different languages and it fits together perfectly with no contradictions when it is rightly divided. Think about that how that could have happened. Men that did not know each other, that lived in different periods of time, that lived in different places, that wrote in different languages, wrote a book inspired by God that fits together perfectly. Amen. That ought to let you know that that's the Word of God. Amen. The Bible is a book of harmonies. It has one theme, one message, one story, and one song. 
As holy men recorded the theme, message, story, and song of the Bible, God unfolded His plan and purpose for receiving glory by the Lord Jesus Christ in redeeming the universe and humanity from the guilt and curse of sin. When Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, then there was a curse placed upon man and also upon this universe. And the Bible tells us that one day that curse is going to be removed. Many people genuinely des desire to know how to understand the Bible. This course is designed to teach students to know how to understand the Bible. There are three basic rules. Rules are, are called axioms. In seminary somewhere you may say, what is this axiom? Axiom <laughs> simply means a rule. There are three basic rules one must accept if he's understand the Bible. Number one. The Bible is the Word of God. Number two, the Bible is inspired by God and has absolutely no errors in it. And number three, there is a real need for Christians to personally read, study, and apply the great truths found in the Bible. Amen. I've had many people that have come to me before and try to point out the errors that there are in the Bible. And you listen to many preachers or teachers on the internet or on television or on radio or sadly even in many of our Baptist churches, many of them can't get up and preach a sermon without correcting the Word of God and say, well, that's an unfortunate translation right there. Right. I believe the Word that I have, the book that I preach from, the Bible that I use is completely without error or contradiction when it's rightly divided. There are two schools of thought concerning how to study the Bible. One method of Bible study is the dispensation approach. It is also called the Bible by ages approach or the Bible by periods approach. The Bible is divided into several dispensations. Now dispensations is a good word, it just means periods of time. The manner in which God dealt with man is different in each dispensation. When the Bible student uses the dispensation approach of Bible study, he will study the entire Bible from the standpoint of what developed historically in different ages and customs. This approach places emphasis on leading personalities from the different dispensations. It looks at where these leading Bible characters live, the races with which they were associated, and the primary historical events of their lives. The dispensation approach is a very interesting method of Bible study. Another method of Bible study is the subject matter approach. This method of studying the Word of God is to approach the Bible from the standpoint of subject matter or topics and how God dealt with each subject matter under the different Bible divisions or sections. It is a study of doctrine in the light of what each and all of the Bible writers said about the same subject matter as a whole. Each particular subject matter is studied in the light of the grand purpose of God in redeeming man and creation unto his final glory. The lessons in this course present the subject matter approach of Bible study. The student who masters this approach will have his faith in God and his word increase as he discovers that the Bible is a book of harmony and there are absolutely no contradictions in it when it is rightly divided. If one studies the Bible using right, right means correct divisions, he will likely come up with right conclusions and arrive at truth. You might need that on your test, so if you're marking anything, you might mark that down. If one studies using wrong divisions, he will likely come up with wrong conclusions and arrive at error. You might need that on your test. I'm helping you. <laughs> Thank you. The divisions of the Bible. In Luke chapter 24, Verses 44 and 45, the Lord Jesus Christ recognized and approved and used three distinct divisions of the Old Testament. 
At the time of Christ's ministry on the earth, only the Old Testament had been completed. Now let me say that. When the Lord Jesus was here, all they had were the 39 books of the Old Testament. By the way, if you go to a Jewish temple today, those are still what they use as their Bible, the 39 books of the Old Testament. And that's what they had during Jesus' time. And so Jesus rightly divided the Old Testament into three divisions. And when his disciples recognized those three divisions of the Old Testament, their understanding was open that they might understand the Scriptures. Now I've written down the Scriptures here so we can go through our lesson. But I do hope that you will take the time to look at them in your Bible so that you can see this. The Lord Jesus Christ, in Luke chapter 24, verse 44 and 45, he divided, he divided the Old Testament into three divisions. Now, if he wrote the Old Testament, then he ought to know how to do it. And so he divided the Old Testament into three divisions, and they are divided right here. In Luke chapter 24, verse 44 and 45. And he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things might be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Verse 45 says, then, and I underline that in my Bible and also on this manuscript that we're reading from, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. Now let me just say what the Lord Jesus is, what this scripture is saying. The Bible says Jesus divided the Old Testament into three divisions. And I hope that you have your Bibles because we're going to mark in them in just a moment. He said when these disciples understood what those three divisions were, then they could understand the scriptures. And so it could be inferred and implied that if you do not understand the three divisions of the Old Testament, you're going to have a difficult time understanding the Scriptures. Jesus divided the Old Testament into three divisions. Remember we said rightly dividing the word of truth? So he divided it into three divisions. When the disciples understood what those three divisions were, then they understood the Bible. They understood the Scriptures. The Lord Jesus divided the Old Testament into the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms. Do you see that in verse 44? I underlined them and highlighted them. Yes. And yes. Yes. And they're not underlined in your Bible. But do you see the three divisions? Yes. Those are the divisions that Jesus gave us. Recognizing and utilizing these three divisions of the Old Testament will help the Bible student as he studies the Word of God by various topics. The student who fails to recognize the divisions of the Old Testament will almost certainly fall into doctrinal error. And I'll tell you more about that later on. Now, many Bible schools and seminaries and colleges divide the Old Testament into seven divisions. However, there is no scriptural sanction for this practice. And it hinders the student of the Word of God from effectively answering gross doctrinal heresies and false teachings by those who teach that Christians are under part of the law. There are certain people that will teach Christians that we are under certain parts of the old Mosaic law, but not under other parts. And if you don't learn how to rightly divide it, then you're going to be meat for them. They're going to take you and chew you up and spit you out, and you won't know how to answer them. But if you'll listen closely and let the Holy Spirit teach you something, you will learn how to rightly divide it so that you can give an answer to them when they ask you about certain things or they tell you certain things. The seven wrong divisions of the Old Testament are the moral law, the ceremonial law, the historical books, the major prophets, the minor prophets, the Psalms, and the poetic books. The Bible makes no distinction between the moral law and the ceremonial law. Now you know what moral law is? 
That deals with morals. For instance, uh, the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery. Moral law. Ceremonial laws are laws that they said that they had certain dietary things. You know, you couldn't eat certain things. And on certain days you had to do this. And you had to go and take animals to sacrifice as ceremonial laws. And in the Old Testament, you've got both of those things. There is moral laws and ceremonial laws. But Jesus made no distinction in them. He simply called it the law. And this will make sense to you in just a minute. Why? It's unwise to make a scriptural dis the, uh, distinction between moral law and ceremonial law. There's no distinction between the major prophets and the minor prophets. Major prophets, as we'll see later, uh, when I was young and didn't know any different, and I may have been like some of you, I don't thought the major prophets, Isaiah and Jeremiah, uh, were more important than the minor prophets. Uh, but there, the Lord made no distinction between the major prophets and the minor prophets. The major prophets are simply books that are longer than the minor prophets. But there's no distinction. One is not more important than the other. They're both important. And that's why Jesus did not make a distinction between them. And there's no distinction between the Psalms and the poetic books. We will see in a little bit that all of these certain books that you'll see in the Bible that we call the Psalms are more than just the book that's called the Psalm. There's others, Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon and Job that are referred to as poetic books. While there is some merit to the argument that dividing the Old Testament into seven divisions makes it easier to remember certain historical facts, to do so will lead to gross Bible error when studying doctrinal matters. Now, the Bible says the law was fulfilled. That's what the Bible says. Now, I'm hoping that I brought my Bible tonight, I think, and I was picking everything up, and I uh, did not bring my Bible. I left it, I think, in the car. I need a Bible. There's a book of Bibles in the back. Can somebody bring me one? Cool. The Bible says the law was fulfilled. Now, what was the law? What was the Old Testament law? Law of Moses. Law of Moses, all right. Now, it was fulfilled. Now, either it was or it wasn't. Dividing the law, thank you, Dr. Eric. Dividing the law into two divisions, moral law and ceremonial law, will cause confusion when interpreting the following scriptures. Now, if you have your Bibles and you need them now, if not, you can look on with somebody. Turn over to the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew, chapter number 5. The book of Matthew, chapter number 5. And I want us to look at verses 17 and 18. Matthew 5, verses 17 and 18. Now, as you know, Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is referred to as called the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon ever preached. Matthew 5, I want you to look at verse number 17 and 18. Go ahead and take a minute and find it if you don't have it. But look at verse 17 and 18. Now notice what it says. This is the Lord Jesus speaking and he's teaching to his church. He says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I came not, I am not come to destroy, but what? To fulfill. fulfill. Okay, so why did Jesus come? He came to fulfill the law and the prophets. Isn't that what he said he came to do? Yeah, yeah. He said, don't think that I came to destroy it. I didn't come to destroy it. I came to fulfill it. Verse 18, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law. Now, most Baptist and probably Pentecostal and Methodist and Episcopalians and everyone else, but I know more about Baptists than I do anyone else. And most Baptists will stop right there. 
Let me read verse 18 again. For I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law. Notice after law there's a comma. Uh -huh. That means the sentence is not completed, right? right? And notice what the last part says. Till all be fulfilled. Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law, I came to fulfill it. And he said, not one part of it will be done away of the law or the prophets. Not one part will be done away until it's all fulfilled. Now I ask you the question, did Jesus fulfill it or not? Yes. yes. Then if he fulfilled it, what does that teach you? That we're no longer under the law of Moses. Thank God we're not. And I'll tell you more about that in a minute. I like to eat catfish. <laughs> I like to eat bacon. Yes. In fact, I'm so particular about bacon that I don't really like store-bought bacon. I ordered bacon from Tennessee. We ordered uh, 12 pounds at a time. And it's, it's bacon that's cured the old-fashioned way. Old, great bacon. And it's more expensive than the junk you buy in the store. But it doesn't all fry away, and the taste is much better, and I think it's better for you. And I'd rather not eat as much of it and have good stuff than that stuff that they give you at HEB or Walmart or somewhere else. Now, that's just me. But I like bacon. But under the law, they couldn't eat bacon. I like ham. I like good old smoked ham. I like chorizo con huevos. I like that. I like the old. I like ham. I like catfish. I like that. But under the Old Testament law, you couldn't do it. Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy that. I came to fulfill it. And he said, not one jot or tittle would be done away till all be fulfilled. Yeah. And so if one plus one equals two and two plus two equals four, then that ought to tell you something that when he fulfilled the law, then it's, it's no longer a rule for us to follow. Well, you say, Brother John, I don't know about that. Well, stay with me. Turn over to the book of Galatians. A little farther over in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Then you get over into the doctrinal books. 1 Corinthians, Galatians. Galatians, after Romans. And look over at Galatians, chapter number 3. Galatians, chapter number 3. And I want you to look at verse number 10. Now it would be good for you to study all of this, but I want to give you just a minute to find it. Galatians chapter 3. And I want you to look at a, verse number 10. And if you don't know where to look, get your, get your uh, contents page and find it there so that you can find it. Galatians chapter number 3. And we'll take a minute for you to just find that. Galatians 3, verse number 10. Galatians 3, verse number 10. Now this might help you. Help you. Galatians chapter 3 is right after Galatians chapter 2. <laughs> so I want to be as helpful as I possibly can. So I, I just want to help you. Galatians chapter 3. Look at verse number 10. Notice what it says. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. Now notice what the writer of Galatians is saying. If you're under the law, you're under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Now listen, if you are under the law, if you don't keep every single law, then you are under a curse. Notice what it said. It is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in what? All things. Which are written in the book of the law to do them. Look at verse number 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. Amen. Being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Now, Jesus took the curse upon himself. Amen. And he has redeemed us from being under that curse. 
And so glory to God, hallelujah, praise God. That ought to even make a backslidden Baptist shout. <laughs> if he can understand that Amen. great truth that we are not under the curse. Why? Because Jesus paid the price. Now, look at verse number 19. Wherefore, then serveth the law? Now, that's a good question. The writer, and I believe it's Paul that wrote Galatians, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says, remember first, if you're under the law, you're under the curse of the law. But glory to God, praise God, when Jesus died on the cross, He took and paid the penalty that we had to pay Amen. so that we don't have to be under the law anymore. Thank so you. we don't have to be under the curse anymore. In verse 19, He writes the Galatians, Why then do you want to keep serving the law? <laughs> Jesus has already paid for it. Why do you want to place yourself back under the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed, that is Jesus, should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by the angels in the hand of a mediator. Look at verse number 24. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. Now what is this chapter teaching us. We were under a curse because we had sinned. But Jesus, the perfect Son of God, died on Calvary's cross and He paid for our sins so that we don't have to be under that curse anymore. We don't have to be under the law anymore. Now if you remember, if you keep yourself under any part of the law, you're still under the curse. Amen. Any part of it. And we're going to see where in a minute that makes a big difference in things. Praise God. Jesus made a way that we don't have to be under the curse. How do we do it? The law was given to us to show us that we couldn't keep it all. Yes. There's no one in here, no one that's ever lived other than Jesus that could keep the law perfectly. And if you didn't keep it perfectly, then you were under the curse. But praise God, the law was given to us as our schoolmaster to teach us that we could not keep it perfectly so then by faith we could accept what Jesus did for us. And that's what salvation is. Realizing that He paid the penalty for our sins because we couldn't keep the law and accepting what He did for us by faith as our Savior. Now, if you would also look at Colossians. That's just a couple of books over. Galatians, Ephesians, and then Colossians. And if you would look at verses 14 of chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, verse 14. Just a little bit past Galatians. you got Galatians, and then Ephesians, then Philippians, and then Colossians chapter 2. I want you to find it. If you don't find it tonight, then you be sure and you find it in your Bibles at home. Look at verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Now what's that saying? Now you know what blotting means? If I had me a, a, a soft drink here, and I spilled some of it, I could take a paper towel and I could blot it up. I could take it away. I could clean it up. When Jesus died on the cross, He blotted out the ordinances that were against us by dying in our place upon the cross. And He took all of the law, all of the Old Testament law, the moral law, the ceremonial law, and He nailed it to the cross. <coughs> Verse 15 says, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Verse 16 says, and here's good instruction. Let no man therefore judge you in me. What does that say? Nobody has the right to tell you you can't eat certain things. Now, there's a certain church that used to teach that on Fridays you couldn't eat certain meats. Yes. The yes. Bible says, let no man judge you. By the way, if any church or any man 
tells you that there's certain meats that you can't eat. The Bible says in the book of Timothy that that is a doctrine of devils. So anytime anybody tells you that you can't eat certain meat, that is a doctrine of devils. And therefore, let no man judge you in meat. Now, in what you eat. Now, let me say this. There's certain things I don't want to eat. <laughs> now, I just don't have an affinity for manure. I mean, cow stomach just doesn't appeal to me. But if you like it, eat it. Enjoy it. Roy or raw oysters just don't appeal to me. Now, if you like raw oysters, then you go ahead and eat it. I told you about the man that went into an oyster bar one time, and they said, I will bet you $100 that you can't eat 100 oysters. He said, I can sure do it. You just bring them out here. And so they brought out those oysters on a half shell, and they put them there, a big tray of them, and he took one. You don't chew oysters, they just go down. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And he just continued on. Twenty, thirty, forty, fifty, sixty, seventy, eighty, ninety, ninety-one. 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, 100, 99, 98, 97, 96, 95. Now listen, there's certain things that we like to eat and certain things we don't like to eat. But the Bible is very clear that there are no dietary restrictions for New Testament Christians. He goes on and says, or in what you drink, or in respect of a holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days. Now we're going to say more about that in this lesson tonight and in future lessons. But there are certain churches that will teach you, certain places, that you, if you worship on Sunday, then you've taken the mark of the beast and you can't be saved. By the way, that's what Seventh-day Adventists yeah. teach in their official doctrine. You say, well, I know a Seventh-day Adventist that doesn't believe that. Well, I know a lot of Baptists that don't believe things that are what Baptists believe. But that is official doctrine. If you worship on Sunday, you've taken the mark of the beast. And you've got to worship on Saturday, which is their Sabbath day. But the Bible is clear that let no man judge you by that. Verse 17 says, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Now, turn over to 2 Corinthians. Turn back a few pages to 2 Corinthians chapter number 3. 2 Corinthians chapter number 3. And I want you to look, if you would, at verse number 6 through 11. By the way, if you have questions or things, make a note of it, and if at the end of the class, we will take those. Uh, since we're recording this, it will help it, and we'll answer those after class. But 2 Corinthians chapter number 3, and if you would look at verse number 6. 2 Corinthians chapter number 3, look at verse number 6. Take you a minute and find it. These are written down here, and I hope that you'll go look them up in your Bibles during the week, study them, learn them, and learn the truth from them. But 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6 says, Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. But if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones. Now, the administration is the administration, is a word that we use more today. If the administration of death, written and engraven in stones, what is that saying? The Ten Commandments were written in stone, right? Yes. yes. And if you broke any one of those Ten Commandments, the penalty for that was being stoned to death. 
If you broke any one of those Ten Commandments, the penalty for it was being stoned to death. Now look, for the administration of death, written in engraving in stone, was glorious. Now the Ten Commandments are glorious in the sense that they were our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. How shall not the administration or the administration of the Spirit be rather glorious? Now, for if the administration of condemnation be glory, if the Ten Commandments were glorious, much more doth the administration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. For it, now verse 11 is a key verse. For if that which is done away was glorious, what was done away? The law, mm -hmm. the law of Moses. Now don't get upset with me. Included in the law of Moses was the Ten Commandments written on stone. For if that which was done away, the commandments written on stone, the law of Moses, if that which is done away was glorious and that it brought us to Christ, how much more that which remaineth is glorious. Now what remaineth? The law of Christ. The fact that Christ paid for our, penalty, our sins on the cross. And he says, if the Old Testament law, including the Ten Commandments, was done away with, how much more glorious is what we're under today? Now, the Seventh-day Adventist cult in your manuscript, notice I call them a cult because that's what they are. When they teach things that are damnable, things that will damn your soul if you trust in them, if they teach a salvation by work, if they teach something that will damn your soul, that is a cult. That's not a true church. The Seventh-day Adventist cult invented the teaching of the moral law in order to justify their heretical teachings concerning the keeping of the Sabbath days. The Seventh-day Adventist church teaches that you've got to keep the Sabbath day, which is one of the Ten Commandments. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The Sabbath day begins at what we call Friday sundown and goes till Saturday sundown. Some Baptists and other Christians, Pentecostals, will say, well, the New Testament Sabbath is Sunday. No, it isn't. It's not Sunday. The Sabbath has always been from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. Now, the Seventh-day Adventists still keep that. The Jewish religion still keeps that. The Armstrong religion still keeps that. Jehovah Witnesses, 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 they still keep that as the uh, law. But that is not right. That's not according to scriptures as we will see. Also, the Seventh-day Adventists have certain dietary restrictions. They can't eat pork. There's certain things they can't eat. And as the Bible says, and we'll learn in this course, that is the doctrine of the devil. Now, the Bible makes no distinction between the prophets. Some people ignorantly and erroneously think the major prophets are more important than the minor prophets. The primary distinction between the major prophets and the minor prophets is that the books of the major prophets are longer than the books of the minor prophets. The first division, now remember, the Lord Jesus divided the Old Testament into how many divisions? Three. And what are those three divisions? The law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. All right. The first division of the Old Testament Jesus recognized was the Law of Moses. The Law of Moses is the first 17 books of the Old Testament. Now I want you to look in your content page. I want you to look at the front of your Bible and find the content page. Alright? Where you've got all the books listed. The students should look at the contents in the front of the Bible and mark the first 17 books. Notice, put it, I put it kind of in a bracket. I start at Genesis, and I go all the way down to Esther. That's 17 books. And in my margin there, I write the Law of Moses. So if you wanted to do that in your Bible, you go from Genesis, 
Go all the way down to Esther. I put kind of in a in a little bracket, if you please. And, and then I write in the margin, the law of Moses. The student should look at the contents page and mark the first 17 books, Genesis to Esther, as the law of Moses. Now I'm going to give you a minute to do that. Let you do that. If you don't do it now, you can do it later. The Pentateuch, Penta, you'll hear a lot of people speak about the Pentateuch, preachers and Bible teachers, and there's nothing wrong with that. Penta means five. It is the first five books of the Old Testament and was written by Moses. Now look at the first five books. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That's the Pentateuch. Those were all books written by Moses. The next 12 books, Joshua to Esther, record how Israel's government functioned in carrying out the law of Moses under Joshua, the judges, and the three kings of the undivided Israel, Saul, David, and Solomon. And so those first five books were the law as given to Moses. The next 12 books were the law as carried out by the Jews. But Jesus just referred to all 17 of them as the law of Moses. Now, the second division of the Old Testament Jesus recognized was the prophets. The prophets are the 17 books from Isaiah to Malachi and were written by Old Testament prophets of God. As mentioned above, there's no scriptural basis for dividing the prophets into major prophets and the minor prophets. The student should mark the 17 books of the prophets in the table of contents of his Bible. So if you begin at the first book there, Isaiah, and mark all the way to Malachi, which is the last one, you either highlight that or mark that, and then in your margin you can write the prophets. That's when Jesus referred to the prophets, those were the books that he referred to. The third division of the Old Testament Jesus recognized was the Psalms. The Psalms include five books, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. When Jesus referred to the Psalms, those were the books he referred to. The five books of the Psalm were written in poetry form and were used with mu musical instruments and sung and worshiped at the house of God. Psalms, the word Psalms means inspired book of songs and poetry. The student should mark the five books of the Psalms in the table of contents of the Bible. So you can mark those five books that were mentioned, that I have mentioned, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. Put a little bracket around them, and you can write in the margin, Psalms. And so the three divisions of the Old Testament Jesus referred to was the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Now, the divisions of the New Testament. You want to keep your contents page open. There is no inspired statement of a proper division of the New Testament. In the Old Testament, we could go to Luke chapter 24, verse 44 and 45, and we can find an inspired statement as to what the division of the Old Testament was. In the New Testament, there's no verse we can go to, or passage we can go to, that divides the New Testament. But we're still told to rightly divide the word of truth. And so, it is certain that Bible students are expected to rightly divide the New Testament, 2 Timothy 2.15. There is a logical division of the New Testament. The logical division of the New Testament is, there's three divisions. In the Old Testament, how many divisions? Three. three. And what were they? The law, the prophets, and the Psalms. In the New Testament, there's three divisions. There are the historical books, the doctrinal books, and the prophetic books. All right? The first division of the New Testament is the historical books. The historical books, and you might look there, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. Five books. Those are historical books. 
I didn't say hysterical, historical. <laughs> because some people will look at the miracles that the Lord Jesus did. They will look at the miracles that those apostles did and they say, oh, there's nothing to that. But they are true. They are historical, a history of what Jesus did. They provide an inspired record or history of, and here's some things, the ministry and message of John the Baptist as he prepared the way for the Lord Jesus Christ to come and establish his church. They give a record, a history of the ministry and message of John the Baptist. And by the way, you'll never really understand the ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church, until you understand the ministry and message of John the Baptist. We'll teach that later on. There's also a history or record of the personal ministry of Jesus Christ and of Him establishing His church. And in those books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts, is a history of the first church functioning and carrying out the great commission that Christ gave to His church. The first five books of the New Testament contain some doctrinal truths and some revelations but they are primarily historical and doctrine. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts are primarily, mainly, historical. They mainly have history. And if you try to base doctrine from those books, you're going to get into doctrinal error. The students should mark the first five books of the New Testament as historical books in the table of contents of his Bible. So if you mark those, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, put them there and write history or historical. That will help you in understanding the division of the New Testament. With Acts. And Acts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. Thank you. The second logical division of the New Testament is the doctrinal books. The 21 doctrinal books are Romans through Jude. These books were written concerning some particular doctrinal matter and our doctrine. It is from these books that Christian doctrine is primarily derived. There are some historical facts and some prophetical facts in the doctrinal books, but they are primarily, mainly, doctrinal in nature. The student should mark the 21 books from Romans through Jude as doctrinal books in the contents of his Bible. And so you can put brackets there, mark them however you want, and that's the second division. The third logical division of the New Testament is the prophetic book. There is only one prophetic book in the New Testament, and that's Revelation. It is to be considered the New Testament guide for a study of things concerning the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and the end of the ages. Sometime you may be interested in taking my course on eschatology, a doctrine of end times. There are some historical facts and some doctrinal truths in the book of Revelation, but it's primarily prophetic in nature. It tells about things that are going to happen. In conclusion, now you like that part of the lesson, don't you? <laughs> We're about through. In conclusion, the student should recognize the Bible is one harmonious book and that there are no contradictions in it when it is rightly divided. The Old Testament is to be studied under three specific divisions. The Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms. The New Testament has three logical divisions. The historical books, the doctrinal books, and the prophetic book. The student who recognizes and utilizes these divisions will avoid doctrinal error and confusion. Mm -hmm.